All right, so in this video we're going to be covering chapter five, section three, which is electron configuration and periodic properties. And the first of these properties that we're going to be covering is something called atomic radius. Now, as you may have guessed, uh, the atomic radius has to do with the size of an atom. However, because the border of where an atom sort of ends, this is a very fuzzy line due to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and the behavior of electrons. So you can't just assign a radius r definitively and say that's the atomic radius. So what chemists do instead is they'll take two atoms and bind them together. Let's say this is two hydrogen atoms. And then they take the distance between the nucleus, or nuclei rather, and then what they do to find the radius is they just take this and divide it by two. And then you get what we call the atomic radius. Now if we look how this trends across a period on the table, uh, we can see what you'll notice is that as you go across the period, the radius of an atom starts out bigger and then gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you go because as you get down over towards this end there's a stronger nuclear charge due to the extra protons like there's five protons in boron, six, seven, etc. as you go all the way down and then as you go down a group you may expect that it would get even smaller because these atoms down here have a large nuclear charge as well however what you'll notice is that as you go down the group they get larger over and over again because as you add energy levels what ends up happening is that takes so much space that it overcomes the uh, attraction of the nuclear charge plus as you add energy levels there are more and more electrons inside each energy level which reduces the effective nuclear charge. That is, if you take the net positive charge due to the nucleus and then add the negative charge due to these electrons, you'll find that they experience less charge as you go further and further out. And an easy way to remember this is to think of it as a snowman blowing bubbles. You make the, the lowest sphere of a uh, snowman the largest, with its head at the top being the smallest sphere and then as you go across you can see it's blowing bubbles. Now I know the bubbles aren't getting bigger however it makes it easy to remember the group trend. Now the next thing we're going to be covering is a property called ionization energy and before we do that what you have to know is that if you take an atom given by this simplified nucleus and electron cloud here and you apply enough energy to it what you conventionally get is you can remove an electron from the atom. And I'll give you a mathematical representation. So let's take an atom A, you add some energy, and then what you get is A plus, because you took away one negative charge, so it leans more positive now that you've gotten one negative away from neutral, plus an electron. Now an ion, which is what this is called, the A+, plus, uh, is an atom or molecule that has a positive or a negative charge. Basically, it's an atom or molecule that isn't neutral. For example, if you take a sodium atom and then take away one of its electrons, what you'll end up with is the sodium ion, Na+, plus, and the electron out in free space. Now any process like this where you take a neutral atom and end up with an ion at the end is a process known as ionization. And what chemists will do is in order to compare how easily uh, elements can give up this electron, they will measure the energy required to remove one electron from a neutral atom like sodium and this is measured in kilojoules per mole meaning the amount of energy in kilojoules required to remove 
electrons from one mole of substance. So now that we know about ionization energy, the next thing we have to do is look at how it trends across the table. And if you look at 15, figure 15 in your book, which lists the ionization energies for various elements, what you'll find is that they are highest over here on the right and lowest in groups one and two over here on the left. Now this isn't just a coincidence because uh, these first two groups, if you'll remember, have electrons in just the very lowest levels but of a new energy level. So they are farthest from the nucleus. If you'll remember the atomic radii, you have the biggest atoms over here and the smallest over here. Now it's very hard to remove an electron from uh, a shell that is closer to the nucleus because there's a bigger positive charge. But if an electron is just sort of floating loosely out in a brand new energy level, what you'll find is that the net positive charge it feels is much smaller and it's much easier to take away an electron and form an ion like Na+. Atomic radius and nuclear charge also affect uh, ionization energy going down a group, if you'll remember from the snowman blowing bubbles. Uh, atoms tend to get larger as you go down a group, which means that the electrons are farther away with more electrons between them and the nucleus, meaning their effective nuclear charge that they feel is much smaller. So what you'll find is that the ionization energy decreases as you go down a group. Now you can also remove electrons from ions. Let, let's say you had taken away one electron from lithium to make it lithium plus, which has three protons and two electrons, giving it the net positive charge. Now what you could do is you could take away another electron, giving you three protons and one electron, sorry, and this process is called the same thing. This requires a huge amount of energy called the ionization energy. However, it's called the second ionization energy, represented by the symbol IE2. Now IE2 is always going to be greater than IE1 because let's say you have the three electrons sort of around lithium like this. Again, not an accurate model, but it's it'll work for what we need to do here. If you take away this electron right here, what you'll notice is that you have the same nuclear charge in the middle, the positive. However, these two electrons now feel a greater net force because there's not the extra electron around them. And this ends up decreasing the atomic radius which leads to an increase in ionization energy, as we just covered. Now, if you look over at this plot of the various ionization energies for lithium, you'll notice that from its initial ionization energy to its second ionization energy, there is a huge jump. And this is because after you remove the first electron from lithium, you have to come all the way back over here to helium, which is covered up. However, helium has a stable noble gas formation. And what you'll find is that removing an electron from a stable, from a noble gas uh, configuration is very difficult because noble gases are in a very low energy state. They're very stable, very unreactive, and nature wants to keep it that way. So removing this second electron causes a huge spike. And what you'll find is that whenever you end up with a noble gas uh, configuration for an element after you've ionized it, for example, after you go to, after you uh, take away two electrons from beryllium and get its second ionization energy, there's a huge spike to its third because you're taking away from what was then a noble gas configuration. And this continues all across the period.